The following presentation was recorded at the Upstate Carolina Linux Users Group and is licensed under a Creative Commons Share Alike Attribution 3.0 USA license. For more information about the Upstate Carolina Linux Users Group, please visit uclug.org. Hey, Jeremy. Okay. Um, pieces there uh, on the back, there's hats, and I've got stickers floating around somewhere. Um, feel free to consume whatever you'd like. So, back in February, I left being a sysadmin. Um, I don't know how long I will be gone from the sysadmin trade, but I left. Uh, being a sysadmin to do work for a startup in Silicon Valley called uh, Cloud.com and uh, to work on their open source project called CloudStack. <coughs> uh, a lot's happened since then. Um, so the company that I started working for was originally called VMOPS. Uh, they stayed in stealth mode for almost two years and um, ended up uh, open sourcing their product, which was CloudStack, in May of 2010. When they initially open sourced it, uh, there was a lot of features that they did not share with the world. Um, uh, a lot of features initially, and that gradually became more and more open. Um, in July of this year, uh, Citrix acquired them for a very large sum of money, and they, at least the founders, very happy to be very well. Um, in August of 2011, we dropped the open core uh, model and went completely open source, which is something that uh, a number of us have been working to do long before we were acquired and uh, finally got accomplished. So, before we dig into how awesome CloudStack is, uh, <laughs> regardless of where I go and regardless of how knowledgeable people are, uh, the question, what is the cloud, comes up. And what's on the screen is the NIST definition, uh, which is how the government defines the cloud. And that's a, probably a good base. Um, what you need to know is that the cloud is awesome. <laughs> Except I'm spelling it wrong. The cloud is, is awesome, and, and credit to Dave Nelson for coming up with this. Um, it's on demand, it's self-service, it's highly scalable, and it's measurable. So you're not paying for arbitrary servers, you're paying for how much uh, actual compute time you use, along with how much network bandwidth, along with how much storage. Um, uh, so, you know, the cloud is is hyped a lot. Um, if you are talking to a vendor, they will promise you that a um, a pink unicorn comes with every purchase. And uh, the cloud is awesome, but it's not awesome the way that people tell it to you most of the time, especially if they're trying to sell you on something. So cloud computing is it has become such a ambiguous term that there are multiple types of clouds. There's software as a service, there's platform as a service, and there's infrastructure as a service. And uh, there are even divisions underneath that. Within infrastructure as a service, there's compute, storage, and network. Um, <coughs> so basically people have tried to get cloud to the point where they can slap it on anything and sell it to you. So, this is the limit of my aesthetic capabilities. And you can see it looks ugly. But this red line shows the demarcation between a provider and the end user. In a software as a service model, the end user only controls data. So, with Gmail, which is a SaaS uh, product, you only control the email coming in and going out. Uh, you don't control the actual application, you don't control the app server. You certainly don't control the VM or the hardware that it runs on. Um, Salesforce.com is another example of software as a service. Uh, effectively, you control the CRM data going in. You don't control anything here. Platform as a service moves this down a little bit. Effectively, they provide you an app server, be it something like JBoss or, uh, or even uh, Tomcat. Um, and uh, they'll allow you to drop your application and your code and your data, and they will take care of everything below the red line. And you can see this red line's a little straighter. Um, I, I was having a much better night at that point. Um, and 
And so basically all of this is, is abstracted away. You don't know what any of that is and probably don't care. And infrastructure as a service is a little bit lower. Your end user sees the virtual machine. They can control that. They can control any of the layers above that. Um, but they don't actually get uh, visibility into the hypervisor or the actual hardware. Have I lost anybody so far? Anybody have questions? Sure. You dropped two levels with this last slide. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, you know, typically infrastructure as a service is not going to know anything about an app server, um, and it's not going to have a real way of managing your the uh, VM's operating system. All right. So that was the quick five minute, what is a cloud? Um, and you now know more than 90% of the tech press and uh, certainly more than most of the salespeople trying to sell you cloud stuff. Uh, so cloud stack is a free as in speech and in beer um, infrastructure as a service platform. It does, uh, it supports cross hypervisor so you can have multiple hypervisors in your cloud uh, you can do complex networking, you can do firewalling, load balancing, um, and it's designed to be multi-tenant. So the first customers for cloud.com were service providers. You had, um, you had people like Tata Communications and Korea Telecom who were wanting to sell Amazon-like services, and so they needed this idea where users were going to come and, and log in and take advantage of those services and um, and so it had to be multi-tenant from the start. So what I haven't really told you is what do infrastructure as a service clouds do? I told you that it manages somewhere below a red line, um, but effectively uh, an infrastructure as a service cloud platform will manage high availability. Um, this is a marketing slide, so it's not really high availability. Um, it's very rapid mean time to recovery. Uh, so we do have some high availability stuff, but for what most people think of, uh, this is really, we check and make sure that if a VM goes down, we'll restart it. If a host that VMs are running on goes down, we will restart them on other, on other hypervisors. Um, one of the big things that probably are most confusing is networking services. So there are at least, <coughs> six different network models that you can choose with CloudStack. You can use security groups, which are really scalable, um, not, not perfect isolation, but pretty good. And effectively that isolates the bridge level for the hypervisor. Uh, you can do VLANs, so you have a VLAN for each customer. Uh, you can uh, do all types of external routing, so if you by default, CloudStack does all of this networking stuff with an internal software router that runs on a VM. Uh, if you really don't like that and you want to use your Juniper router or uh, some other type of router that we support, um, certain Cisco and, and um, Arista networks, etc., uh, you can use your external hardware and we'll manage that hardware for you. Uh, we'll also provide you load balancing and we'll do that either with the software load balancer or we'll use a, um, we can use like an F5 big IP uh, and manage those, uh, manage your load balancer externally or internally. Uh, provide you with, uh, with firewall, port forwarding, NAT services, VPN endpoints, um, site to site VPN is coming uh, probably in the year. So, um, Lots of lots of options here, and this is where most people get it wrong, at least the first time, uh, because there is a ton of potential complexity there, particularly if you're doing uh, some of the stuff that requires external hardware. So we also have this idea that we can allocate VMs and resources based upon algorithms and availability. So if you have a regulatory compliance issue that says, Thou shalt not run any three-letter government agency on the same uh, hardware as four-letter government agencies. Uh, you can apply rules like that. Uh, more realistically though, 
people are using it by saying, you know what, I don't have enough coverage in the eastern part of the United States. When I deploy this next VM to handle capacity, make sure that it's deployed in one of the eastern zones. The default, of course, I think is first bit. So the first uh, hypervisor it comes to uh, that will handle it, it'll, uh, it'll take that. So it can go from really simple to really big. Um, but really it's about abstracting away your interaction with virtualization and networking. Um, CloudStack is largely hypervisor agnostic. Uh, we support KVM, OVM, Zen servers in cloud platform, VMware. Um, there's work being done on Hyper-V, if anyone cares, and also on um, also on uh, OpenBZ. So that's not a real hypervisor. And we can also manage just bare hardware. So it gets to the point where you don't care what it's running on. All you care about is I need to deploy VMs, make sure they go in the right place. I've got an algorithm that figures out where they should go and go from there. <clears throat> but also it's going to provide that multi-tenant capability um, because the idea is that it's self-service, that your user is asking for the service and they're able to fulfill that request themselves. <clears throat> they're able to log in, uh, log into a website or use the API and do things with their with those resources and so of course you need to be able to put limits on them um, one of the things you don't want is a monitoring system or an end user to consume all of your capacity because they're playing with uh, trying to get a uh, api call right or because there's a denial of service attack going on and finally the that measurement standpoint it's not going to track just the counts of vms it's going to track uh, the types of VMs, maybe the type of storage. If you, uh, if you set up different types of storage, the amount of CPU, the amount of memory, the amount of, uh, of actual disk space that's consumed, as well as allocated. Uh, and it will track that for you, and that allows you to uh, either bill, charge back, or, or make other decisions based upon that. So I mentioned that we, uh, that we can handle multiple hypervisors. That's what we support today. Um, bare metal's up there, and we support basically anything that's IPMI 2.0 or later. Um, so if, if your application is really heavy and you actually need real bare metal access, you need it to run on the bare metal rather than in a hypervisor, we can turn your machine on, provision it, when it's done with whatever it's doing, we can turn it off so that you're not burning up additional power. Um, and then when you need it again, turn it back on and reprovision it for something else. And so we're seeing a lot of people with high performance compute clouds who are starting to adopt the bare metal stuff simply because they need to be able to crunch uh, without the, the overhead of uh, VMs. So we define our resources into zones, pods, clusters, and then finally hosts. The hosts are physical hosts. Um, the zones, most people use those as data centers. Um, we've got a guy in Brazil who wants to do really weird things within a single data center, and he's got multiple zones uh, running inside a single data center. So in some ways, it's arbitrary division. Um, we have the idea of pods and clusters. Pods are just an additional uh, hierarchy there. Um, clusters are something that have to be hetero, uh, sorry, homogenous. Uh, so it's got to be the same hypervisor, uh, the same uh, the same type of processor because you can migrate between hosts in a cluster, um, and uh, and preferably uh, you also have to have your network be completely homogenous. So what's ETH zero on one host has to be ETH zero on another. Um, we also have this idea of separating out users. And so we have this idea of domains and accounts. Accounts can have multiple users and accounts are placed into domains. And each one of those levels, both the domain, the account, and the user can have limits on their resources. And those are, uh, 
those are incremented. So if you have limits on D DM instances uh, and then limits on a uh, number of snapshots for a, for a different level, those would apply for persons lower than both of those. And finally, you have that same UI and same API that they have access to. So has anyone used Amazon's security groups? So Amazon's EC2 came up with this idea of security groups and essentially the hypervisor, um, the hypervisor's network interface is a bridge. And so that means that traffic that goes from, uh, from hosts that are on the same hypervisor have to connect to that bridge as if it was a switch uh, or if it was a hub really. And anything that leaves that also has to traverse that bridge. That means that if you start setting up firewall rules and isolation on that bridge, you effectively are isolating the, the host there. The reason that this is, this is even an issue though, is because if you try to isolate with VLANs, you've got some, some issues when you start scaling. Uh, so the real low end of layer two switches will do eight VLANs, the high end, will do 4,096 max. That's the max standard permits. So if you have more than 4,096 customers in a single data center, you start running into that. Um, on top of that, if you go above 1,000 VLANs, your switch hardware is astronomically expensive. Um, just being able to keep up with the routing between them, et cetera, <coughs> it's very expensive and you time. Um, and so the cost to do this is almost nothing. Uh, there are places that easily have 10 or 15,000 security groups um, in a single data center, and they couldn't pay any amount of money to do that with VLANs. So that's why you'll see, you'll never see a VLAN stuff uh, at Amazon, and it's because they have too many customers, they have to use security groups, they have to filter the bridge and isolate the bridge. Um, so we also handle all of this, uh, all of this networking service. So we'll take care of DHCP for you. We'll do uh, all of the firewall and the routing, uh, even if that's managing an external um, device. Here's another marketing slide. Uh, so you main time for recovery for high availability here, and you have what really happens. Um, Effectively, we, we monitor instances that are identified as high availability, and we monitor um, we monitor all of the hypervisors that are running, and if one of those goes away, we try and restart it. Um, there's shared storage back, backing it all, so that works relatively well. Uh, the interesting thing is, it works for all supported hypervisors. So if you want to do high availability in KVM right now, you can't. Uh, it's not. It's not supported in the hypervisor. I have a suspicion that we may see that out of the new version of Overt. It's supposed to be debuted uh, in November. But right now, if you had to do high availability and, and um, in KVM, you'd be writing the scripts to monitor, restart, etc. So we treat the system VMs, that router load balance or secondary storage that stores snapshots, etc. We treat those as high availability and again, high availability in quotes. And we will automatically restart them. And we just added a redundant router feature that effectively keeps two routers up at the same time and uses VRRP to, to make sure there's an active one always. So I'm gonna show you in a few minutes the very beautiful CloudSAC web interface. And it is awesome and it's one of the things that, that people constantly call out but people who are really using the cloud don't use the UI. Um, nobody wants to click through five different steps uh, 50 times to bring up 50 machines when they could use a for loop and, uh, and curl do the same thing. Having that API also allows external applications uh, such as your monitoring system or if you have a platform as a service writing on top of your infrastructure as a service platform. Uh, it would allow us to spin up new instances to deal with load. It also allows you to loosely couple that for things like billing. So 
So I've told you lots about what it does, um, the real quick overview of the structure. We have a management server that's stateless, so we don't care if you have one or 50, and we don't care if they go down. Um, the cloud will continue to stay up, uh, regardless of the management server's presence or not. Same thing with the database, although of course you need both to have new things happen within the cloud. We then have some cute nodes, which are hypervisors or bare metal hardware. Um, we have this idea of primary storage, and primary storage is specific to a cluster, and that cluster gets access to the primary storage and shares it among all the nodes. So if you have a machine go down, you can automatically restart it on another host and it has access to the same disk back image. We have the idea of secondary storage, which stores templates and snapshots, so that if you take a snapshot, uh, it's not cluttering your primary storage, which is probably going to be faster. Uh, it's going to instead uh, push that off to the slow secondary storage and uh, not consume IO cycles. And then we have uh, some virtual resources like a router and a console proxy to provide you um, console access. And the console stuff is all JavaScript and it's VNC in a JavaScript uh, session. So no plugins needed, you just need to have uh, JavaScript running for that particular page. And so I've talked about how we divide up resources, but we also have this idea of tags. So I could say really fast storage gets a fast tag and only the stuff that I say can have that tag will be deployed there. I can do the same thing with the zone, I can say you know what, this is the NSA's zone. Nobody but the NSA can deploy here. Um, and, and I'm getting chuckles, but there's actually a four-letter government agency that's doing exactly that. Uh, they are a multinational government agency, and they divide their resources up by country. So, let me see if I can uh, come over here, and I will show you the beautiful, gorgeous, Slightly outdated file stack UI. And when you mentioned JavaScript, is that on the then that's on the client side? Yeah, right? so so if you come into an instance, find one that's up. So here's one that's running. And that is all in JavaScript. Because yeah. JavaScript has no latency whatsoever. I'm more interested in you, you know, blocking the machine. Um, that would be even fun, wouldn't it? It would. And that's all in JavaScript. So you can do that on virtually any device. So give you, this is, this is actually a demo instance, so there's lots of stuff to explore here, but not very deep. Um, you'll see I've got two zones set up, one in San Jose and one in Chicago. The San Jose zone has a single pod, and then if you look at the clusters, I've got a KVM cluster, two Zen clusters, one is XCP and one is Zen server, and then a VMware cluster all running in the same cloud, all having stuff automatically deployed to it. <coughs> I don't know if this is the one. So you can also look here, and you can see that I've got, um, I've got a public network that everyone can have access to, and there's still isolation on. And then I've got multiple VLANs here as well that are tapped on to provide additional segregation where it can be afforded. And you'll notice that this massive cluster of KVM machines is a single machine. So there's not much that's exciting there. However, one of these Zen server clusters. So this has multiple machines in it. Um, that's not very exciting. <coughs> Really 
So I can take a host and I can enable maintenance mode. And it will take all of the instances that are running on that on that host. And you can see there was only one at the time. But it will end up migrating back to this one and then shutting that one off. So if you need to do software upgrades or if you need to actually touch the physical hardware, you can move everything off of it. It'll take a few minutes to migrate it, but uh, regardless of hypervisor, that will work. So we talked real quickly about IP addresses and just to show you one. Uh, so each of those instances will have an internal IP address and then they'll have an external IP address that can be acquired see that you can acquire a new IP and you can uh, you can see when you acquire one it's going to allow you to assign it to an instance and then you can do port forwarding with it you can do load balancing uh, and load balance this is all in software for this particular one um, and you can see that this one is uh, load balancing port 80 and you can see all of the uh, you can add multiple hosts to it. And then of course you can have it be a VPN endpoint and it will do uh, PSK for IPsec. And we also have this idea of security groups that I was talking about earlier. Let's see what the, there are no rules. So, this particular security group allowed port 1 through 65,535 coming from 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0. So effectively, they opened all the ports up uh, for anything that had that security group. So we also have this idea of volumes. The volumes are attached to machines. So you can see that this is the root disk for uh, a LAMPSAT instance with that name. And you can see size, etc. You can see where the storage is. And you can do a number of things with that. You can snapshot it if you care. If you don't want to snapshot the entire machine. Uh, you can also download the volume. So if you want to move it elsewhere or play with it on your local hypervisor. Um, and of course, from a template or from a snapshot, you can make a new template to deploy with. Have I thoroughly confused everyone? Anyone have questions so far? Yeah, I, I hear the thing that you're like saying where a service it starts to fail and then you try to restart it and if it doesn't restart it, you'll move it over to the what is actually checking, monitoring that and what has I mean what is there software that is this using existing stuff just in the putting it together in a different way, or is there new applications or new things that have to be? So we very coarsely monitor. Um, for, for actual hypervisors, we make sure that we can communicate with them. If we can't communicate with them, we assume that they're dead. And then so we start like fixing it off. At a certain end, then you have right. software that, you've written new software that kind of fills in the gaps where you check to see if it's not up, sure. then you have and the next part of the program says, okay, try to restart it. If that doesn't work, go on to the next step, which would be to move it over to a bring it up right. on the... And, and there's lots of fancy things that happen there because you don't want to have a situation where you've got split brain, right? Where you have a host that, just because you can't communicate because someone unplugged the network cable uh, to your management server, is still doing things, uh, you know, changing a disk file. So there's a number of things that we also <coughs> monitor disk-wise to make sure that writes aren't still occurring uh, to make sure that we can, uh, to actually use the term uh, stone and shoot the other node in the head, because we want that to go down. We don't want writes from a, from a host that's not completely up going on. Um, for the VM, we're doing something similar. We're checking disk writes. We're checking network connectivity, you know, that the disk is, that the machine is actually there and communicating over the network. Um, so it's very coarse but it seems to work. The fencing is relatively robust and, and uh, you don't tend to have problems with that. But it's also 
it's not true high availability. No one who wants real high availability <coughs> is saying, oh, come in and I will use the cloud stack high availability as my high availability solution. There are things like ForSync, Pacemaker, um, Linux HA that are designed around providing truly high availability services. And so those are still, still the rule. This provides very rapid mean time to recovery. So you can, you can shrink your mean time to recovery and it's very little effort to set up as opposed to most of the other uh, high availability engines. But it's also very coarse. So this is an administrative tool here and sure. you're, you're administering a test environment somewhere. Yes. Right. Now, and I mean, typically you see companies where you do the administration for them, where they have people locally that do their administration? They're, they're doing it all locally. Um, so, do you, do you do that as a service or do you charge more if you have to you know, it? So we offer some professional services to help get things kick started, but typically they're large enough that they will do it all on their own. So, so that particular customer, for instance, um, they, they do things at a scale that quite honestly most people can't fathom. Um, there's another one that's not up there whose cloud was running in a single zone, 128 gigabits per second of network traffic. Um, so, you know, there are people that are doing things at a scale that most people can't conceive of and they wouldn't dare outsource it. Or if they are, they're outsourcing very carefully. So Zynga, for instance, they do a dual model. They, uh, when they deploy a new game, they deploy that game to EC2 first because they simply do not know what kind of load it's going to bring. They don't know how popular it's going to be. Um, they don't know, you know, maybe a flop. They're not going to spend the money on the hardware up front. They'll run it for a few months, figure out where that where that sweet spot is, where it makes sense for them to bring it back in, because it's cheaper for them to run their own cloud services if they're keeping the hardware at 100%. They'll bring all of that game back in, run that locally, and then anytime demand surges, they'll push the extra demand up to EC2. And I'm sure they use other cloud providers as well. Um, but yeah, most of these folks have a very impressive internal infrastructure system. Um, these are obviously a lot of big names. Uh, there are about, about 80 paying customers right now, and most of them are in the 500 to 2000 physical mid range. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're not going to have somebody who uh, who is only there for part of a week administer the entire system. So, so do, you, do you actually run the resources of GlassStack or you just provide software that... We just provide software. All we do is write software. So you don't have data centers software. and all that. Oh, well, we... I mean, so day job obviously does, right? Um, but yeah, we're not, we're not reselling file services. As a matter of fact, you'll notice groups like Top Highlight, IDC Frontier, um, Korea Telecom, which are gigantic ISPs, um, and we would not want to compete with our customers, so no way we would offer services. Um, but yeah, they're, they're all, virtually everyone that, uh, that uses our software has their own internal IT stuff. <coughs> and yes. Any other questions? Why did Citrix want to uh, want to this connect? So um, several things. Uh, I think Citrix, and so I, I speak for myself because I don't. Uh, I don't pretend to think that I know the mind of Citrix, and certainly after being an employee, I'm convinced of that. Um, so. Citrix, I think, uh, realizes that we are really in the PC era. That's where the box has made its money as remote desktop. Um, they got into the virtualization game, 
uh, with Zen Source uh, 2006, 2007. Um, and I think they saw things headed towards the cloud and they realized that they needed a cloud play that made sense. And we have very broad adoption um, and are very robust. Um, some of the outside of Amazon and outside of rack spaces, uh, public cloud. Um, CloudStack powers some of the largest clouds in the world. Um, and sadly, with the exception of Zynga, um, most of those don't have a name up there. You would be surprised at some of the places that are running very, very large clouds. Um, so I think, I think that's why it made sense for them to buy us. Um, I certainly think that if they are planning on having Zen server continue to prosper, the cloud, so all of the public clouds, the, the Amazons, the rack spaces, et cetera, about 80% of those are running Zen server or some variant of Zen. So if they intend on keeping that type of number, they're going to have to be very involved in the cloud one way or another. So uh, I, think it, I think it makes sense for them and well, I guess we'll see what they do with this. So CloudStack does not have racks of servers if you're not renting out space. You develop software, but you said you have paying customers. Or They're paying us for support. support. Yeah. When you have 15,000 physical nodes and you know, a good chunk of them go down, you want someone's neck to, to choke. And, uh, you know, if, uh, there is no, there is no publicly traded company or company with the same board of directors that will allow you to run something upon which your enterprise depends and not have a support fund in place. Um, it's uh, it's just too risky, and the cost for support is too low. So they pay us, they pay us for support essentially. Yeah, flight right now. Yeah, it's That's a really good example of. Somebody who has something that their entire infrastructure depends on, and nobody would call them themselves. Anything else, or I'll move on. All right. So the interesting thing is being able to do an API uh, call. So uh, you can see the URL. Um, I'm essentially passing that URL. I'm telling you my API key. Uh, and I'm giving it a signature, so it's using uh, cryptography to identify me, uh, and I'm signing that specific request, and I can copy and paste that URL, and assuming no one has messed with my <coughs> account. Uh, yeah, someone has changed my password. <laughs> so I've got multiple people actually using this account, but you can see the error. It says, I can't verify who you are. <laughs> Just to make sure I didn't have a copy of the price issue there. Someone may have changed my ADI. I was going for his mind. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's not letting me in. It's not letting um, but effectively, that should have returned the job ID, and of course, there's been a fail going on. And uh, it should have automatically provisioned one of these. The interesting thing is, you can do about 400 machines if you have the adequate hardware behind it. You can provision 400 machines in eight minutes. Um, that means that you need to have other things like automated provisioning and, and um, uh, config management in place because nobody wants to have 400 machines come up and nothing to do with them. Um, I'm desperately looking for people who know Python and people who know Java. Um, we are largely a Java body of code and our founder was the guy who wrote the JVM initially. Um, so we've got a strong, strong Java um, presence there. Uh, I love people hanging out in Hash Cloud Stack on IRC, so feel free even if you just come control me. Um, I would prefer you not use the forums and instead use the mailing lists, but uh, feel free to 
feel free to come by me or talk to me if you care about clouds or cloud computing. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things. I think that uh, for better or worse, we are largely heading towards a cloud-dominated infrastructure. Um, especially as a large number of questions get settled around security and things like that. Um, I think the world will be more comfortable with cloud computing and you will continue to see, uh, see that. In, in 2009-ish, uh, there was a report out that said that 23% of the world's traffic, internet traffic, went through EC2. Um, so think about that. If, if two years ago, 23% of all the web traffic in the world went through EC2, where's it at today? Um, so I think, I think cloud and cloud <coughs> services are, are unavoidable, better or worse. Any other questions? I see a security problem. <laughs> lots of security problems. Lots of, lots of security problems that are difficult to deal with, especially when you're talking about multi-tenant services. Um, it will be a large, a large nightmare for someone. Oh, well, I mean, it's, uh, with that big of a system, you've got so many people working there, mm -hmm. so many people that can have access to it, that the situation might be a uh, national security agency, uh, army brat that turned loose all the classified information. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go up by 10 or 20, it goes up by billions. Could very well. And that's one of the reasons segregation is so important and it's going to continue to be an issue because think about what can happen if if you're in a hypervisor and you can jump out of that ring that that virtualized ring to a uh, to the lower ring on the uh, cpu you can then control all the virtual machines on the on that hypervisor there are there are a lot of problems like that that uh that i think will have to be solved look at, look at right now we've got a problem the remote control of the uh, drones mm -hmm. and classified information possibly leaking out. Yep. Uh, there's so many people that have access to it now. How do you stop it? Yeah, it, it's a very difficult problem to solve. Um, that said, it gets worse every day. It does. That said, it's incredibly cheap, and I think the economics of the situation and the ease of the situation are going to drive a lot of adoption. So two, two interesting statistics. The typical time to deploy a server, even if it's virtualized in corporate America right now is eight weeks. If you can do it in eight minutes, you just cut eight weeks off of your wait time, which means you can iterate incredibly fast. Um, one of my friends, John Willis, who talks a lot about DevOps, um, he goes into this idea of, uh, you know, you're, you're going to fail most of the time in anything that you try. So if you're developing something new, you want to develop and fail as fast as possible. And so he talks about um, two online brokerage firms and effectively one of them had cut their processes down so that they were so efficient that they could offer trades to their customers cheaper and make a profit cheaper than their competitor could do it internally cheaper than it cost their competitor to execute the trade and uh, so i think the economics of some of the things that that this empowers are going to be uh, driving adoption significantly go ahead i see a comment <laughs> You were laughing, so I assumed you wanted to. <clears throat> well, no, I was just laughing. But that's called when you've got a cross advantage like that, you just wait till the other one goes out of business. It, it's just a matter of time. The, the winner's already decided, they just haven't announced it yet. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, I think that more and more places are seeing that. I think if you look at the operating efficiency of places like Netflix and Zynga, it's scary. Um, most companies might do a production deploy of a software application once a month. It's not going to be the same application, but maybe once a month they'll do a production deploy. There are people at places like Facebook and Zynga and Netflix that are doing production deploys for a single application 
multiple times a day. Think about how scary that is if you are a traditional sysadmin with a very disconnected developer environment. And think about how hard it would be if it took you eight weeks to provision a server. Um, that's, that's well not impossible. So this doesn't solve everything. It's, a, it's one tool, but it's, uh, it's a tool that can hopefully be useful. Yes, sir. I'm sorry to distract from this one point, but what does that even mean to deploy new software three times a day? I mean, they're, they're making changes to their production code and deploying a new copy of their application into production multiple times a day. How do they effectively test? If they spend more time testing than they do uh, anything else. Um, the vast majority of their development time is spent testing. And if you're interested in reading about this, it's called the DevOps philosophy. Um, uh, and essentially what they do is they have made their system so robust and so uh, incredibly automated that they'll deploy, they'll run their automated tests, and then they'll have all of their monitoring around what is the application supposed to really be doing? And if it doesn't do that, they automatically roll back and redeploy the last known good. Um, and they do it really quickly. Uh, I mean, there are places that can deploy nationwide an entirely, entirely new application, including the test suite, excuse me, in under two minutes. Um, and they're doing that iterate very fast. If it fails, great, we'll kick it back and it won't get deployed. If we catch it with an automated test, if we don't, we'll catch it with something else and kick it back to something else. But they're finding that being able to uh, to iterate that fast makes them a lot more agile. It makes them uh, able to deploy new features incredibly rapidly, and uh, it takes some rigor as far as you know, you've got to write tests long before you write the code. You've got to uh, you really got to adopt test-driven development, uh, and then you've got to trust all of that. Make sure that you have all of that instrument. Exactly. Yeah. Answer your question, huh? Yeah. How does that affect their architecture? Do they spend a lot of time trying to have major pieces? So, by historic standards, extraordinary clean interfaces between the major subsystems. So, so they can replace one. Yes. And, and and be sure the other through okay. And part of their part of their ongoing testing is to constantly make things fail, even in production. So uh, Netflix has long had this concept of the case, <coughs> which is effectively a daemon that goes in and it can shut down machines, shut down services, etc. And uh, and the chaos monkey goes in place, and so. They have to have a very robust, robust architecture that doesn't care if 15 of those web servers <coughs> die. Um, they they can operate around that. So uh, um, yeah, it's there is a lot of thought in the architecture. The people doing architecture uh, at that scale and at places like that are incredibly smart. And uh, um, so there's. The guy who runs OpsCode, um, one of the co-founders of OpsCode, his name's Jesse, uh, they write some config management software called Chef. Uh, he used to be the, uh, he had the term master of disaster at Amazon. And some of his tests would involve shutting down entire data centers. And invariably, they would discover problems. And they're like, okay, it's time to shut the data center back on now. We need to get that back and like that. No, I'm sorry, the tornado tore it all to pieces. It's no longer there. <laughs> and, you know, uh, people like Bezos are calling him up saying, but we really need to get that online. He's saying, I'm sorry, there was a tornado and that data center no longer exists. Um, and and that, type of, that type of mentality has driven them to be, uh, to have very robust architecture in the first place. And, to assume that failure is going to happen, uh, rather than we really hope it doesn't, but we'll find out if it does. Uh, we'll monitor and see if it does. Uh, and so, I think one of the key differences is 
they assume that every piece in the puzzle is going to fail, and yet they still have to continue working. Making it better by making it fail harder. Yes. Fell harder and fell faster. So you're a software company, and people, I assume, download your software and install it on a machine. What, what is your development cycle? What is your release cycle? Um, if you'd asked me a month ago, I would have told you every month we release a new version. Um, right now, I think we're going to end up going to quarterly releases uh, and uh, slow that down a bit. Um, simply because I think when we were in startup mode, everyone was okay working the 18 hour days, all day, every day. And now that we're owned by a, a large corporation, um, that urgency and uh, fun and adrenaline rush of being in a startup is kind of gone. So uh, I think it's gonna slow down. We are, we are nowhere near what some of these places that are, that are doing it right are doing it. Um, uh, they, they beat us significantly and sadly we are just one of the single tools that can be used to, to make it awesome and uh, we do not have a lot of the other tools in place internally. Anything else I can answer? If not, I will shut up. There's plenty of pizza and Cokes and there's stickers here, there's hats there. Feel free to take some. Yes sir. So Reddit migrated to the cloud. Yeah. And subsequently failed. Yes. Failed hard, failed off with their I noticed you had several marketing slides with high availability and and other uh, buzzwords. Yes. How will your service prevent somebody like Reddit from failing hard and off? It will not prevent. It will we allow you to fail on your own terms as opposed to failing on someone else's. Um, so, so the, the nothing in the cloud is a is one of those uh, magic pink uniforms, and just because you're in the cloud does not mean that you automatically get high availability or magic uptime numbers. Uh, it still requires very good architecture very good design and probably even a greater emphasis on failure because especially if you're using outside service you don't even control the, the, uh, the machines you're being deployed on. So we just change who's responsible if you fail. We change that to yourself as opposed to an Amazon or, or KP or Tata. Anybody else want to troll? <laughs> Didn't the, uh, the Amazon service go down a couple of years ago? No, it's not been that long. That was a few months ago. That's what Reddit was using it. Yeah. And Reddit had an uptime that was fairly appalling for about three weeks and then they failed entirely. Yeah, they. And a lot of companies did. And for better or worse, it should have been assumed, right? If, if your business comes from being online and being online all the time, <laughs> you're going to have to do some architecture and going to have to do some design work that assumes, excuse me, that assumes failure. And Amazon provided a lot of tools to make that more robust and very few people took advantage of them. There were, I mean, there were people, there was a place that did uh, organ donor registrations on Amazon and they were on US East. That was the only place they were. And they kept calling saying, we really need to get this up. You know, this is important medical stuff. People's lives potentially are impacted by the unavailability of the service. And there's nothing you can do to get it magically up. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like someone was purposefully keeping it turned off. They just decided to put all of their apples in one basket and that basket was, uh, was a failure. Well, what happened that it took down the whole System though, I, mean, I thought you'd think they would have it set up fault tolerant wise, where it always be running. But so they, they had three. They had three sets of links, and effectively, two of them died, from what I understand. The third link was not capable of carrying all of the traffic, and so it never really came back up. So it was n plus one redundancy, and they didn't have they didn't have n to begin with. 
just like what happened the day that Microsoft was there. On the day that skip, mm -hmm. they planned for the very worst and hoped for the best. And guess what? It got 20 miles out to sea and died, and they had to tow it back in to Norfolk. Yep. <laughs> All right, well, I appreciate you guys listening to me. Thanks very much. You still work around here.